Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Big Questions Podcast. I'm so glad you tuned in today. Let's pray together as we get started, and then we'll dig into today's question. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much just for who you are, first of all. Creator, sustainer, Alpha and Omega, our Father, our Savior, our Counselor. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for this time with you, and pray that, God, you would be the one leading and directing it, that that uh, the answers we, we look for, we'd find in you, that it would be your power, your spirit, never human cleverness as we seek to understand the things that we talk about on this podcast. Please, God, protect this time. Please use it however you want to. And just thank you for time with you, God. It, it, it's good to be near you. For un for undistracted, hopefully, focused time with you. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this week's question comes with uh, my thanks to James for bringing up the topic. And the question goes like this. What's the deal with other Gospels that you hear about sometimes? You know, like the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Mary, or the, the Gospel of Judas. Gospels, in quotes, that aren't in the Bible but ones that get attention in the news sometimes or, or get documentaries about them on the History Channel. You know, what's the deal with those? Should they be in the Bible? Is there something pastors like me aren't telling you about them and, you know, there's some sort of conspiracy behind it? I mean, well, that's not going to be a problem after this podcast because I'm going to tell you all about them right now. But what's the deal with other Gospels? Well, basically, anytime you hear about other Gospels, it's kind of like this. Imagine for a moment that I'm a singer in a modern day pop boy band. Okay, just just go with me on this. Imagine I'm in a boy band, but we're not as popular as we'd like to be. Okay, so I come up with an idea. I know, I'm going to write a brand new song for our band to sing. But when I list who wrote the song, I'm not going to say it was me. Instead, I'm going to sign Elvis Presley's name on it. Okay, then I'll write another song. For us to sing. But when I list who wrote that song, I'm going to sign Michael Jackson's name to it. All right. Then I'm going to contact record labels and news outlets and I'm going to excitedly say, Look what our band found. We found lost songs that were written by Elvis and Michael Jackson and they just happen to fit perfectly with our band's musical style. So we'll be recording and releasing these soon, but only as part of our band's music catalog. Well, that's ridiculous, you might say, and I'd, I'd agree. And yet, understand, that's basically what's going on with so-called other Gospels that people get all whipped up about, okay? When, when you hear about books like the Gospel of Thomas, or the Gospel of Judas, or the Gospel of Mary, or a bunch of others that I'll mention later, understand, the names of those books are misleading, because they weren't actually written by Thomas, Judas, Mary, or anyone else who actually walked with Jesus Christ personally during his ministry on earth. Okay? In fact, if you watch documentaries about things like those on the History Channel and such, when scholars are interviewed about those other Gospels, if you listen carefully, you'll hear the scholars say things like, those other Gospels were written way after Jesus' ministry by people like the Gnostics, basically as ancient propaganda to promote their beliefs rather than the beliefs of authentic Christianity. Then the Gnostics would just attach famous Christian names to what they wrote, like Thomas or Mary, and the Gnostics would try to pass their writings off as authentic Gospels when they actually weren't. Kind of like if a failing pop star tried to pass off his new song as one that was written by Elvis or Michael Jackson, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So when it comes to why the other Gospels you hear about aren't in the Bible, there's a really important reason for that. It's because they're fakes they're, and they're heresy, right? But, but wasn't Gnosticism a form of Christianity, someone may say? Uh, no, not even close. But didn't they call themselves Christians? Well, but how many people today call the, who call themselves Christians very much are not the real thing? right? The question is, what did they actually believe? What did their lives actually show? Because when it comes to authentic Christianity, man, the earliest historical Christian creed we have tells us exactly 
what authentic early Christianity believed, right? We've talked about this not too long ago at our church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul actually quotes an early Christian creed, probably the earliest one we have, when he says this. Listen, this is from 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 1. Paul says, quote, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, there it is, right? This creed, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. And here's the creed. Paul quotes it. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the twelve, the twelve apostles, right? And Paul goes on, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, right? You don't believe me? Go ask him. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Okay? That middle part there, though, is the oldest Christian creed we have, dating back to probably months within when Jesus was crucified and resurrected. Okay? That is what authentic Christianity is is all about and has been about since the beginning. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, right? He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. He appeared to Peter, then to the 12 apostles, and as Paul goes on to say, others too, right? That's Christianity at its core. And yet, when it came to Gnosticism, their belief system, their religion was all about something very different. It was all about trying to find the secret gnosis, the the word that means secret knowledge, hence Gnosticism. It's all about secret knowledge. In fact, Gnosticism actually existed before Christianity. They just tried to latch on to Christianity and latch on to Jesus once that came on the scene later on, right? How convenient. They, They said that Jesus is the source of the secret knowledge they had been seeking, right? But in reality... The foundational beliefs of Christianity that we see in that creed and the foundational beliefs of Gnosticism are worlds apart, okay? As scholars Bradley and David Nystrom talk about in their book, The History of Christianity, which is not a Christian book, right? Secular history book. They say, quote, in contrast to the Bible's view of the world as something beautiful created by God, Gnostics believed that matter was evil and the work of a lesser being called the Demiurge. Moreover, Gnostics argued that God's perfect goodness meant that he could never be directly involved with the material realm, though he might wish to save humanity from it. Gnostics also differed from Christians in their belief that salvation was made possible by secret knowledge revealed by Jesus, not by his atoning death on the cross. And while Christians believe that the human side of Christ was a necessary part of God's plan to save us, Gnostics reject the human side of Jesus as well as his suffering and his death, end quote. Hmm. Basically, the, quote, gospel that Gnostics wrote about and preached was not the actual gospel, the actual good news of Jesus Christ. And realize, that's a really big deal to the real Jesus, okay? The Bible has a ton to say, actually cover to cover, about how bad it is to teach things about God that are not true, okay? God has some scary, strong words for what the Bible calls false teachers, right? About what spiritual punishment awaits them. I think of what the Apostle Paul himself writes in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where he says, quote, Even if we, apostles, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, that original one in that creed, right? If anyone tells you anything different about Jesus or God, let them be under God's curse. Paul says. Then he goes on, as we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Let let, let them go to hell, basically. Paul says that. The Bible says that, right? In fact, 2 Peter 2.17 and Jude 1.13 both talk about how, quote, blackest darkness is reserved for people who teach false things about God. It's a really big deal to God, what we teach about him. Why is it such a big deal, you might ask? Because we're talking about God. 
We're talking about what the holy, perfect creator and sustainer of the universe did in history, what he arranged all of history around, right? Sending his one and only son to live the perfect life we didn't for us and then take responsibility and take hell on himself that we deserved for our sins when he died on the cross to save us when we didn't deserve it. And you don't mess with that. You don't mess with what a holy God arranged all of history around, what a holy God did. You don't mess with people's eternal destinies and teach them wrong things and take away this this opportunity to be saved that God literally gave his son's life to give them. You don't mess with that. And yet that's what other gospels do. They're fakes and they're heresy. And it's not even that difficult to see if you actually read some of them, right? I mean, good grief. In the so-called Gospel of Thomas, we hear so much about, do you know there's actually a part near the end where their version of Jesus says that he's going to turn Mary Magdalene into a man so she can be saved? Yeah, that's actually in there. Nonsense, right? And yet people fell for it. And people today are still like, oh, the Gospel of Thomas, please, right? Gnosticism is nothing new either. Realize this is why authentic Christianity has spent so much time fighting Gnosticism over the last 2,000 years. I mean, you want, a, you want an interesting thing to read? Look up Irenaeus's famous work called Against Heresies and check that out from the 2nd century. Okay? Gnosticism is a problem that is nothing new. And before you get all excited or upset next time someone mentions a lost gospel, please do yourself a favor pause and ask a simple question. Where did this supposed lost gospel actually come from? Because if it's not already in our Bible, just understand there's a good reason for that, okay? It's probably not authentically Christian at all. Someone else wrote it to promote their own agenda and just attached a famous name to it. Just like if I wrote a song and tried to attach Elvis or Michael Jackson's name to it. Doesn't mean it's authentic. I mean, let me read you a list of, quote, Gospels that have been found that we know are Gnostic heresy, okay? Here they come. All of these titles I'm about to read, understand, these are all Gnostic Gospels. They're all fakes. They're all heresy written way after Jesus' ministry with famous names just attached to them, okay? Here we go. There's the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Truth, (laughs) the Gospel of the Egyptians, The Apocalypse of Peter. Doesn't that sound intriguing? The Secret Book of James. Oh, we have James in our Bible, but there's also the Secret Book of James. Wow. The Letter of Peter to Philip. (laughs) Right? We've already used Peter. We've already used Philip's name. Let's use Peter and Philip together. The Gospel of Judas. Don't those sound intriguing? But please hear me. Just because something has a title like those does not mean it's actually legit. And those are not. It may not even be ancient, actually. For example, if you've ever heard of the Gospel of Peter, if you ever read it, you know what's interesting about the, quote, Gospel of Peter? There's no way it was written by the real Apostle Peter. You know how we know that? Because whoever did write it was obviously completely ignorant of first century Jewish culture and the history that Peter lived in. So there's no way it was written by Peter. It also has a ridiculous story in it about Jesus' cross talking at the resurrection. Nonsense, right? If you've heard of the Gospel of Mary before, um, if you actually read that, you might discover, huh, you know, this doesn't sound so much like a gospel as much as it sounds like some kind of protest against some of the rules of the church in the second century to fight false teaching. Yeah, because that's what it was. Uh, apparently, basically, when the authentic church in the second century wouldn't let Gnostic women teach false doctrines in their church meetings, at some point, someone showed up and said, wait, look, I found a lost gospel written by Mary Magdalene, and it says I can preach in your church. Yeah, that's not suspicious, right? Nice try. If you've heard of the secret gospel of Mark, (laughs) that's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt to be a forgery. In fact, it was proven, apparently, it was created by a guy named Morton Smith in the 1950s A.D. uh, when he was trying to promote his own views about homosexuality and jumpstart his failing career as a scholar. And on and on it goes. So church, please listen to me. Any gospel that isn't already in the Bible was left out of the Bible for a good reason. 
And anytime someone comes at you with a lost gospel or some supposed new knowledge, look at it with a skeptical eye. Ask some questions. And stick with the genuine time-tested thing. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the gospels we have that are legit. Paul's letters. That's theology we can trust. Other letters in the New Testament written by people like the actual Peter and the actual John and James and Jude, actual eyewitnesses who knew Jesus personally when he was here on earth doing his ministry. Those books give you the real historically verified Jesus. Those books give you real historically verified Christianity. So stick with them and accept no substitutes. In fact, if you want to study up on this even more, two books I highly recommend for you are In Defense of Jesus by Lee Strobel and Another Gospel by Elisa Childers. Okay, I I have the links where you can get them in the description below this video or this uh, podcast, depending on where you're listening to. And I hope you'll get them and read them and check them out. This is so important and so huge. Accept no substitutes. You want the real Jesus. And praise God, he's there for us. Hey, if you have a question that you'd like us to answer on this podcast, please send it to me. You can email me at office at seasidechurchonline.org. Again, that's office at seasidechurchonline.org. I'll have that in the description too. Thanks so much again for listening this week. And God willing, we will plan to see you again next time.